piece of sheet off. Get the sheet off. See how it's broken off? Just going to tell you one of the um, Chukupa stories. Now, you remember me saying that Chukupa stories, they're there for a reason. And these stories have been carried on down the, down the, uh, the line over 35,000 years. And this is what they start off teaching their kids. And, and these stories are actually a lot more complex than what I'm about to tell you. Because um, as, as you get older and as you learn more and as you gain respect, more of the short, more of the stories actually shared with you, so you get to learn more about the uh, all the all the do's and don'ts and the things that go on. So this is a uh, the story about. Uh, you can you all hear me in the back? No, but you can also go around or just up, move around a bit. Just like make sure you can all hear me and all see in a different direction. So then, uh, Kunya. Kunya is a wama python. Wama python is a very colourful snake. And it's like a banded snake with a gold bands and white. Um, and it's a, yeah, it's, a, it's a python, and the Lira is a brown poisonous snake, okay? So Binmar Kunya uh, was located about 250 kilometres to the east uh, from here, and uh, there was something that was going on with Binmar Kunya. She had this, uh, you know, women who, uh, or ladies, I mean, respectfully, you have these instincts, you have these feelings in your stomach that something is wrong, there's like a woman's instinct. She had this feeling that uh, was something was going on, she didn't know what it was, and, had a bad feeling that uh, her family were in trouble. So, uh, the other point, I just want to back pedal a step. The other thing about these stories, that these, these uh, creation beasts, they're all shapeshifters. They're, they can take many forms. They can be snakes, they can be birds, they can be human form, and they can change backwards and forth, okay? So, so I didn't want to confuse you, I forgot to tell you that part. So Minmar Kunya, being a Wama python, I had this feeling, and uh, located over at El Dunda, if you have driven in, you would have to go past El Dunda to get here down the last of the highway. So I had this feeling, didn't know what it was. So she knew she had to travel to Uluru to come and find out. She said, somebody's in trouble, didn't know what the hell it was. So she created a, what we call an Inmar. An Inmar is a, is a ceremony that the indigenous do. So when they're telling um, you know, stories or um, you're doing dances and, and, and all sorts of things. So she's created this Inmar. She's gathered up her, all her eggs and through this Inmar and through the through the magic, she's actually turned her eggs into a necklace. She's actually placed her eggs in a necklace form around her neck, and she starts making her way down here to Uluru. She comes all the way down to uh, a place called Kunya Piti. Kunya Piti is up the other end here. When we uh, get to do a lap, I'll point that out to you. There's a location up there, and there's a more chukaricha up there. What's chukaricha? Facts. Physical evidence, okay? She's got there and said, OK, I'm going to rest up. I'm going to place my eggs down here at Kunya Piti. I'm going to hunt and just rest until I work out what's going on. In the meantime, Kunya's nephew was actually being chased by Liru warriors. And he was being chased over from uh, Kata Judah. So we all know where Kata Judah is, over there to the sort of you know, westerly direction. And because he'd broken the law over there. And uh, so they were chasing him, and part of the, the indigenous culture, when you break the law, you have to undergo your punishment, you have to take your punishment. And more often than not, the punishment would be, you will be chased, and you would be speared. And, and the spear might be, you know, in the thigh, in the leg, you know, in the, in the body. And uh, once they inflict that uh, punishment, then all is forgiven. And so part of that, uh, their culture is, once you've done that, once they've received their punishment, it's an incumbent upon the people who inflicted the, cut, the, the injury, to, uh, to nurse them back to health. They chased him across here. They chased him over to a place called the Warmala. The Warmala means war party. They've got him on the other side of Uluru here, and there is a location over where they're actually sort of, you can see markings in the rock. And they've tried it, they've tried many spears, trying to hit him. 
and they've missed a few times, and eventually one of these spears hits him in the thigh, in the junta. Okay, so he, he's wounded, and he's badly wounded. And uh, as, as the story continues, they decide not to fulfil their obligations in looking after him. And so they just, just went off and they were just mocking him and, and they were not going to nurse him back to health. Well, Minma Kunya, being up the other end of Kunya Pity, she heard about this and she was enraged. You know, she was absolutely enraged and, and really angry about this. And she came all the way down here as quick as she could and uh, to challenge the Leary Warriors. Now, just quick, I'm just going to show a little bit of Chuka Richer. I just need to check there. I want you to turn around and just look up at the top of the rock there. Now, they're very unusual markings. Normally, you get the markings down straight down. They're normally mm -hmm. the signs of the where the water's been running. If you look to the right of that, you'll see like this snake trail going across. Mm -hmm. See that dark sort of yep. snake? You see it? Yep. Going sort of parallel with the ground. Where all the other markings around Uluru, you'll see coming straight down. Mm -hmm. This is actually Minmar Kunya's trail that she's left behind. She's come around to challenge the Liri warrior. So they come around to challenge, she comes around to challenge this, uh, this particular Liri warrior. And he said, well, why aren't you looking after my nephew? He's, he's, he's done a crime. But, you know, you need to nurse him back to health. And they mocked her and they, they just said, we're not doing it. And uh, that enraged her more. So when she went from there, she said, well, I said, I'm not really happy with this. She then creates another inmar, another ceremony. And what happens is when she's doing this inmar, she actually kneels down on the sand. And she's got a wana stick, you know, the wana the digging stick. She's kneeling down the sand and she puts the wanna stick in there and while she's doing that, creating the inmar, she starts to cover herself with sand. The reason why she's doing that, she's also going to create an arati. An arati is a poison. The poison's going to help her fight the Liru warrior. So she's covering herself in the sand to protect herself from her own uh, poison. And then she gets up and she says, right, you know, she starts moving towards the Liru warrior doing what they call an akuda. An akuda is like a is like a dance that women do when they want to fight. So she's moving, you know, closely and you know, moving up to the Liru warrior to challenge. She's got a wanna stick in hand. And as she comes up to the Liru warrior, she grabs her stick, and the stick's pretty solid, and she cracks him over the head. And he sort of drops to the ground and, and uh, he's in a lot of pain. And uh, anyway, he's he's quite staggered and the poison's also made him weaker. He gets back to his feet again and he cracks him a second time. The second blow is actually the death blow. It actually kills the Liru warrior and he falls to the ground. So uh, in the meantime, her nephew is still mortally wounded and she actually gathers him up and uh, takes him down to Mufajulu waterhole and creating another inmar, you know, he's, you know, he's virtually on his, uh, you know, in his last moments. She creates another inmar and uh, what happens, she, uh, joins their spirits together and their spirits are joined together through this inma and they become one ampi the rainbow serpent and one ampi the rainbow serpent actually still resides there down today and looks after mutajulu the water hole and when the when the uh, when the uh, uh when the indigenous when the sorry the ananu want water down there they actually go down to one ampi and they call out cooker cooker and cooker cooker is, is like this call like we need water and what happens to the water supply down there will be replenished so now for the, the um, I'm going to show you the Chuka Richa. So if I go hit you over the head, what sort of, a, what's going to happen? What you, what's your facial expression going to be? You're going to be in a lot of pain, aren't you? There's a natural reaction to it. You wince, you go, oh, oh shit, that hurt. Uh, I want you to draw your attention to this rock up here. Uh, to the left, the far left hand side, you see the ridge line up there? This is actually the, the Liru Warrior's head. So to the left, you'll see, you might have to move around behind it, just depending on that gum tree a little bit. You'll see the eye, it's actually wincing. Draw your, draw your attention to the far right, you'll see a crevice, the smaller crevice. That represents the first strike across the head. The second crevice is, is the death, death blow. So you've got the first blow, the second blow, the Liru Warrior in pain, okay? And then eventually he kills him. All right, now, on top of that, Minma Kudnya has also been immortalised in stone. I'll draw your attention to this rock just under the the archway here. The shape of that rock. I want you to look about two thirds of the way up to the left hand side. Can you see the divot mm. above, that, uh, above that little ledge there? Mm. Does that not look like a, a Wama Python's head with the eye? Yeah. You see it? Yeah. Yes. The Wama. Now I want you to imagine that's the Wama Python. And those line of rocks is actually, and actually, if you follow the line, it actually curls back up around. So what you've got there is a line of rocks that a wama python's body, 
you know, with the head resting and curled up on itself. You see it? Yeah. So if anybody can't see it, I mean, please ask me because I'd hate you walk away and say, well, I have no idea what I was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's his mouth on the right hand side. On, on the right hand side, oh, yeah. but yeah. So you've got the, you've got the Lyria Warrior, yeah. his eye, two blows, got the Wama Python's head, the body curled around yeah. on top of it. And there is more, and then what I'll do, it's a little bit hard to see from here, but I'll show you also. Yeah, so I'll show you where Minmar uh, Kunya was also kneeling down in the sand on the rock. It's a bit hard to see from here, so it's a little bit further down as we go to Water Julie Waterhole. So you take, by all means, take photos too, by the way. And again, when Ananu want water, they call out Cooker Cooker. And just by the, this is a true story by the way, I went down and I had a group down there, I actually called out Cooker Cooker down there, and the next, the very next day it rained for two days straight, and the water hole was full ass. <laughs> <laughs> Make of that what you will. So, um, righto, so what we have here is uh, it's like a, a family cave. This is, uh, again, you know, for the, all the male, female, uh, bush boys, known as ninkas. Uh, young girls are called kungas. Um, this is where they come. This is a bit like a schoolroom in a sense, or just a, an area where they would, you know, eat, live, uh, teach their kids. So when you look at the, the, the rock art behind me, it's a bit like a blackboard. If we think of a blackboard, we've got the drawings. And yes, it has been used and reused and paintings over the top. These paintings are actually uh, dated back. Uh, they, they've date, been able to date them back to over 5,000 years old. So you're looking at 5,000 years old history here. So, and just also, just a little other bit of physical evidence that something has occurred here. I mean, there's a big boulder there, and it's, it's, not, it's fairly subtle, but if you look at the top of that rock, you'll actually see the top of that rock is actually smooth. This is evidence of where they've actually been doing a bit of grinding, whether they're grinding ochre or sharpening their spears, or uh, more likely grinding seed and making their flatbreads. You know, they, they go, they're gathering the various seeds and their berries, all the bush food, and doing a bit of sort of, you know, grinding down in between rocks, just on that big, on that big boulder there in front of us. And also underneath the cave, you have a look at all the, the black. Um, this is basically the carbon, you know, from the fire. So obviously they come under here. Uh, the caves are fantastic insulators during the weather. You know, cold weather, they, it protects them. In hot weather, it, it's cooler. Um, if you put a fire in it, it's a pretty cozy little place to be. Uh, it doesn't matter, you know, hot or cold. Uh, so you can understand how you know, the cave systems are, are quite, uh, you know, uh, crucial to their survival. Now, we have a look at the, uh, the, the paintings. So we'll start from the right hand side here. Oh, I shall try. So we've got, first off, we've got a, a number of colours here. We've got the yellow ochre, we've got the red ochre, and we've got white and we've got uh, black. So the red ochre and the yellow ochre, that's actually, uh, I believe it's in, look at this missile, is that low cloud? Sort of, more just dust, dust just dust. Don't like smoke. Yeah. Hey? Like smoke, yeah. Right. <laughs> All right. Um, so, uh, what was I saying about the ochre? The ochre's found in fairly good supply, I believe, over near uh, Carter Judas. So they bring that over, they, and so the red ochre and the yellow ochre, you sort of mix down with a bit of water, um, obviously stir that. It's like we mix paint, same sort of thing, and they're doing their, their rock art. The white is from the white ash, and the black is from the black ash, and, you know, from the charcoal. And uh, so then we start looking around, and uh, you remember I said to you about concentric circles on the coast this morning? Mm -hmm. And have a look around and see how many concentric circles you can see around the place. And what did I say they are? They're important meeting. places, they're meeting places, they're uh, mm -hmm. places where you'll find food, uh, water, or all of the above. And, what, and now, what's here? There's it's food, there's, there's, there's shade, there's shelter, um, everything is here. So this is a very important place. Now this is, this is a, a very special place, it's also a place where they can conduct imams, you know, ceremonies. And, um, and there are a number of the cave systems around, right around the whole of Uluru. So, and again, we see the concentric circles up here. And see how they're actually joined, but I think there's one, two, three, four, five, five uh, circles there. And then there's a small one, one, two, three, four, five again. So that's telling a story of a journey between from location to location to location. All right, and when you, as I said, um, when you, you would have seen some of the art back at the cultural centre, you may have seen three, and uh, it's fair to say that normally that would be the story of travel between uh, Katajuda, Uluru, and uh, Mount Connor or Atella. Now, so we've got the we've got the um, concentric circles. We've got the yellow. There's a bunch of other symbols here. Symbols. 
symbols here. Uh, we've got this gold leafy one here. Uh, we believe that to be the golden grevillea. Golden grevillea is a, is a plant that you will see a lot around the, uh, around the whole of Uluru and uh, out at Carter Judah. And what that does, it produces a really bright uh, yellow coloured uh, flower, almost like a bit of like a bottle brush uh, with a grevillea. And uh, in that is, uh, it's actually sweet. Uh, so if you actually like, chew on the, on the flower, you actually get this sweet uh, taste. What they'll also do is actually soak it in water for a period of time and actually makes their bush cordial. It's one of the few things they get to which is actually sweet. So that's the golden revelia. And we look around, we see a few other things and like, you know, how does Western society depict a ghost? You know, how do we, what's your typical ghost? It's a bit like yeah. Casper, isn't it? Yeah. Like Casper the ghost. Can we see Casper the ghost? Yeah. You, you know? yeah. See the red, the red? This is known as a mamu. Mamu. This is a, an evil spirit. All right, if you actually have a look further across, there's a really big one on the other side there. Mamu's evil spirits, obviously telling a story about an evil. And uh, so you've got to sort of study this very closely. We've got this little strange looking symbol up here. Everybody's had their right, oh, it's, a, it's an eyelash, it's a witchy grub, da, da, da. No, no, what it actually is, it's a, uh, it's a tool belt uh, made out of human hair. And uh, again, I was lucky enough to, to um, have a conversation with one of the elders at the cultural centre one day when I had a tour group because I wanted to know a bit more about it. And uh, what they do is they actually harvest the hair of people who have passed away. And with, they refer to this as sorry business. You know, they call it sorry business in, in, in our language. So, so, um, so what they do, they've got the long hair, they actually cut the hair and the women will actually weave it and twist it. And they say, make a tool belt with it and they'll pass it on to you know, the younger girls. They actually tie it around, or boys for that matter. They can use it for whatever, carrying utensils and, and this type of thing. It's actually that human hair. And I actually have felt one as quite, you know, it's a little bit macabre, but yeah. that's what it is. That's their culture. Uh, so this is human hair that is harvested from sorry business. And what else have we got? So have a look around. And boys, you have a look around. Come here and take your photos. So we move across over here. This is the, the really sad part of the story. And again, going back to uh, 1985, there was handback. Um, there are a lot of things that changed here. You know, my role alone, I'm, I'm an accredited guide. Um, so we all have to undergo an accredited, uh, accreditation process. So all the information that I give you has been sanctioned by the Anani and by Parks Australia. I'm not allowed to sit there and embellish and give you any, you know, sort of full dust, unless it's one of my own personal jokes. <laughs> so, but in those days, there was no control. And there were unscrupulous bloody, you know, tour guides would come here and they'd say whatever they wanted they created. There's still some of these stories get around today. I'm right here and I was like, really? really? You know, because... Uh, Basically, if we get caught doing that, we can lose our accreditation and basically you lose your job. So, uh, we, so we look at this, the reason why I mention that, we notice there's a bit of a blank space over here, right? This is going back to the bad old days when uh, tour guys just didn't care. And this, all this platform was not here. People could just walk in and go, oh, this is you know, really cool, and they touch this and do that. And, and uh, photographers, again, really annoyed because I'm also a photographer in my, in my other life. And... Uh, they would come in here with a tour guide. The tour guide would actually bring a bucket of water. And if you know anything about photography, when you actually throw water on, a, on, a, on something, it actually brings out the contrast. Right? In bad old days, you know, they were doing black and white photography. They throw a bucket of water and the photographer goes, snap, 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 and take his photo because he's got the contrast. What's happened? They've just washed 5,000 years of history away on this corner. Pretty, pretty devastating when you think about it. So, um, but now, you know, thank goodness to you know, people complain about regulation and nothing's free anymore. But when you've got people who like that who just don't care, they're washing away history, they're washing away generations of, of knowledge and that. And, and, you know, we would not be able to pass on to our kids and our grandkids and so on. So uh, there's another sort of hair belt. Up there, there's a, there's a like, foot, and that's known as a jinnah. All, all footprints are called jinnah. So as a jinnah, um, up around here somewhere, I reckon there's a couple, just above your head, if you just look up, a couple of boomerangs just up there. So we were also looking at rock art, sort of refrain from touching your body oils and all that sort of stuff. Um, so uh, yeah, a couple of uh, boomerangs up there. If you just sort of look around, you may see other, you'll see some other markings around. So remember what I told you about the, um, about the emu footprints? Yeah. Yeah, three, just a simple way to do it, just hold three fingers up. And you got the, uh, the, the, the thumb and the, and the, and the forefinger. And so you've got the kangaroo, and then you've got the, 
the, the two fingers, and it's probably a bird or another animal, exactly what, I'm not 100% sure, but the, just a representation of different animals. So, uh, any questions? The red oak, the red oak, that's another mamu. Can you see the, to see the, sort of like the hands and the head? It's an evil spirit. Yeah. 